wonder if uh, you've ever had the privilege of meeting someone uh, who you found extremely uh, inspiring in the way that they were living out their Christian faith. There's been uh, a few people uh, like that along my Christian journey where uh, there's just been something about these people as I've spent time with them that has uh, uh, drawn me to them. Uh, I remember uh, my, the first principal when I was at college uh, in Melbourne, uh, a man who I found incredibly inspiring to be around. Uh, he, there was something about him. Uh, it could have been his extremely dry sense of humour, I don't know. Um, but uh, there was something about the way he, uh, when he spoke, he spoke with a certain uh, gravitas, and when he told you off, it was like Jesus was telling you off. It was terrifying. He was one of those people, though, who uh, it was just obvious that years, a lifetime of dedication to the word uh, had, had transformed him to be more like Jesus, and it was inspiring. You have to ask Kate if she agrees with me, uh, as uh, he was her principal too. I remember another lady uh, at my church uh, when I was growing up who, uh, when I took over the youth group from Kate, uh, you're in all my stories today, uh, she, um, she rang me up and uh, asked for a list of all the names so she, should, she could keep praying uh, for every single kid who went to our youth group. And I got to run into her again after I finished college uh, and came back to Tasmania. And even still, uh, she was praying uh, for these kids that they might know the Lord Jesus. And she was an exceptionally encouraging woman. In fact, uh, the last time I saw her, uh, I was in her nursing home room and she was talking about how she had too much money for an old lady and she needed to give it away for the sake of the gospel. Inspiring stuff. Another lifetime where it was obvious that she dedicated herself to being transformed by God and his word and by his spirits. Now I hope that there's one or two people who might come to mind for you like that. And I think one of the great things about these kinds of people is they're, they're, they're inspiring and an encouragement to us, aren't they? they? They show you what could be and they give you something to aspire to as you seek to put about living your own life, trying to uh, follow after Jesus well. The thing about these people who we run into from time to time on our Christian walk is that really they're demonstrating the kind of life that Paul's encouraging the Ephesians to live in this book, which is uh, moving from death to life in Christ, being raised with Christ to live a resurrected life. And people who we see living the resurrected in Christ, living lives that, that reflect Jesus' love and light, they're inspiring. Paul has been encouraging the Ephesian church uh, through chapter 4 and now into chapter 5 to work out their salvation in real and practical ways to be unified under the Lord Jesus and to live the kind of lives that are holy and pure that reflect, reflect Jesus' uh, holiness and purity, that reflect Jesus' love and light as we live lives of love and light. And as we pick up some of the more practical things that uh, Paul uh, encourages the Ephesian church and they're, by extension, us too in this chapter, let's just remember uh, how he finished off. He finishes off chapter 4 uh, with an encouragement uh, to be different, doesn't he? Let me read from verse 31, and if you've got your Bibles open, I think not page 949, uh, around about there. Ephesians 4, 31, 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Paul's encouragement is to live your resurrected life. You've been raised with Christ to live a resurrection life for God's glory. So stop doing those sorts of things that are of the old life and start doing the new. And in chapter 5... 
uh, we pick up his train of thought as he sort of builds on it and says, instead of being people of hate and anger, bitterness, brawling, etc., as he's outlined in chapter, at the end of chapter 4, rather, follow God's example, verse 1 of chapter 5, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, the key for Christian living is knowing God and allowing him to transform us. Because when we understand who God is and his immeasurable uh, uh, well of love and grace, when we understand what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and when we understand how God has been a sacrificial lover for our good, it's transformative. We we can't help but start trying to live like that. There's some sort of uh, uh, deep work of God that happens in us when we understand who he is. That means our our lives naturally start to, to angle in this direction from death to life. We want to be like God. And if we find ourselves reading the end of chapter 4 and going, well, gee, that's a bit of a a wake-up call, isn't it? To get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander. It's a good heart check, isn't it? It's a good heart check to make sure that we are being transformed by our knowledge and love of God. It's a good heart check for us to figure out where we're up to in our walk with God. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, uh, I had some conflict with a guy called Harry. And uh, obviously, names changed to protect identities. Uh, And uh, in the midst of this conflict, uh, someone someone said to me, Oh, you know, the thing about Harry is he's not one to let things go and he always will keep on fighting till he gets what he wants. Now, this is in a church context. I wonder how that description of Harry sounds when you read the end of chapter 4 and start of chapter 5 of Ephesians. I can tell you that Harry was indeed a bitter angry man looking for a fight and seeking to cause my good name whatever that means to be thought of worse by those around me so that he could win the fight that we were having how does that kind of life square with Ephesians 4:31 to 5:2 It's incongruous, isn't it, with the gospel? And that tells you something, doesn't it? And it's a heart check for Harry and it's a heart check for us. Because the truth is that if someone knows you for being a fighter, knows you for never giving up, knows you for holding on uh, to things, then the gospel's not doing its work. The story of God's self-giving love hasn't penetrated your heart. Because if you've met Jesus and you've understood who God is and what God has done for us in Christ, you'll never be known as an unforgiving brawler who will never let things go, but you'll be known as the compassionate, self-sacrificing lover who seeks the good of others at all times. So if you're like Harry today, Repent and spend some more time with Jesus in his word. And if you know someone like Harry, don't fight back. Model God's love to them and continue to pray that they'd realise how much God loves them so that they might have their heart transformed in the power of the Spirit. And the rest of this reading continues with... uh, Paul explaining more about how we are to walk in this way 
of the sacrificial love, understanding God's sacrificial love for us. And so he says that we're to flee from immorality and idolatry in verses 3 through to 7. But among you, verse 3, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place but rather thanksgiving. Paul says, get rid of the old, replace it with the new. You see that? In the place of sexual immorality and impurity and greed, in the place of obscenity, foolish talk and coarse joking, where to put thanksgiving. And I wonder, again, when Paul lists these things for, you, for us as Christians as to be things that we're moving away from, how you think you're going? Is it an encouragement for you today to change? Because there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, of any kind of impurity or of greed among us because we are God's holy people. There must not be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking among us because we should be people of thanksgiving. And the key here, I think, is thanksgiving, right? Because when we choose to give thanks, it helps us put God's gifts in their right place because greed, lust... These are the root causes, I think, of all these behaviours that Paul's telling us to get away from. These things occur when we fail to remember God's goodness to us, that he has given us uh, sex and money and these sorts of things to enjoy in their proper places, and that we will get the most when we trust him and use those things in the way that he has intended for us. And immorality arises when we ignore God and seek self-satisfaction. And that's a big deal, right? We've got to make sure we're checking our hearts because there's a warning that comes next, isn't there? Flee these things, replace them with thanksgiving. Why? Verse 5, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure or greedy person such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. When we are immoral, when we act impu with impu we do, when we're impure, when we're greedy, we're practicing idolatry. Now, this is a bit of a slippery subject for us to kind of understand in the 21st century. Because what is an idolater? There's no place for us to go in Lindisfarne is there to uh, bow down and worship some uh, golden statue that everyone else is uh, uh, worshipping but for the Ephesians you remember uh, they lived in the town of Ephesus or the city and this city was at the heart of idol worship it had a temple to the goddess of Artemis who was the goddess of fertility and you know what they do in temples to the goddess of fertility? They practice sexual immorality to a large degree in public, out in the open. So if you're an Ephesian Christian, sexual immorality and idolatry are in your face and you're expected and welcome to participate in it. For us, it perhaps is a little more subtle. Idolatry works at itself out. And there's not a temple we can go to where we can all go and happily practice idolatry and sexual immorality and greed and lust all in one happy place together. But we can place God's good gifts in front of God. We can place our family, our work, our uh, money, our reputation. These things can take the place of God in our lives. 
and we can start to revolve our lives around them and then we can become idolaters. And so I want to ask you today, Paul says to us that idolaters have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Those who worship someone or something other than God have no place in his kingdom. And so getting rid of our idols is an important task. So, are you worshipping an idol? Is there something that you think is more important in your life than God? And it's likely to be one of these uh, vices that Paul's already mentioned, sex, money. But it could be something else just as easily. A good diagnostic question that someone once taught me for trying to uh, uncover the complexities of my heart uh, and to think about what do I love more than anything else is to, to interrogate my heart and to think about what is it that I fear. I wonder if, you, if I was to ask you, what is the one thing that you fear most of all in your life and I don't mean like spiders I mean the deep thing not having enough money to pay for your life the the lifestyle that you enjoy having to rely on someone else do you fear not having your friends say kind things about you or being betrayed by what someone close to you Do you fear having a family member disown you and and not speaking to you for years or a lifetime? Because if you can think about what it is that you fear most, it tells you what you love most, doesn't it? Because if you fear not having enough money, you obviously love money too much. If you fear not being liked by your friends, you love your reputation too much. And if you fear most having a family member disown you, then your family has taken pride of place. Having enough money, having good friends, having a family, they're all fine things. But when they become the thing and take the place of God, they've become an idol. Our biggest fear should be that we've walked away from a relationship with God and that we will spend an eternity without him. So don't be an idolater. Check your heart and ask God to transform it. Because Paul says if you're an idolater, you'll miss out on the inheritance of the kingdom of God. You'll miss out on joining with all other Christians from every age in perfection, praising Jesus forever and ever. Don't be an idolater. And Paul also says, verses uh, 6 and 7, don't be a partner with them either. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, don't be partners with them. Don't participate in their immorality and idolatry. Paul concludes... Instead of being an idolater, instead of living an immoral life, live in the light and be wise, verses 8 through to 20. He encourages the Christians to strive to live out their new life as children of the light in Jesus Christ and to let their different way of living be something that shines brightly and exposes the darkness of sin and idolatry in the world around us. You imagine you lived in Ephesus and your neighbour was in the constant practice of rocking up the hill to the temple of Artemis to engage in some um, sex with temple prostitutes uh, and you don't do that. That's a pretty stark uh, uh, difference that you're making. In fact, what you're doing is staying committed to your wife and looking after your family and seeking to serve God by going to the, the house church very different way of living to your neighbour next door who's rocking up to the temple of idolatry on the hill. But the temptation to go with your neighbour 
must have been strong. So Paul says, live differently. Let me read to you from verse 8. Once you were in darkness, but now you, are light, now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. I wonder if you've ever had the experience where you found out where you, you're living your life uh, and uh, someone realises you're a Christian and they start apologising for their behaviour. This, this happens to me a lot in the military uh, where uh, people in the military are accustomed to speaking with many coarse words. Um, and when I turn up into the room, it becomes many coarse words with many apologies directed in my uh, uh, direction. And that's a sort of obvious and silly example, but uh, I know of other friends who, uh, who, who kind of use me as their guilty conscience and, uh, and, and they feel like I'm judging them when I'm not, simply because they, some, there's something about the way I'm living that actually God's using to reveal to them that there's, needs, there's something perhaps not quite lining up with the way they're living their life. We need to live in the light, and as we do so, we will have opportunities to share our faith with others. Paul continues, be very careful then how you live, verse 15, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. See, as we seek to live wise lives of, of uh, living in the light, then it's going to create opportunities for us. And so we need to be ready to take the, take the chances that God brings our way. We need to also seek to be doing God's will as we live in the world. Therefore, do not be foolish, verse 17, but understand what the Lord's will is. His will that we live for him. We live as children of the light instead of children of darkness. That we live resurrected lives instead of dead lives. And then we need to be worshipping people because this is what idolatry ultimately is all about the way to not practice idolatry is to worship the right thing and so I think that's why Paul finishes this section with an encouragement for us to be spirit-filled worshippers verses 8 starting at verse 18 do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery instead be filled with the spirit speaking to one another with psalms hymns and songs from the spirit sing and make music from your heart to the Lord all always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if we want to be people who live in the light, if we want to be wise, if we want to be people who flee immorality and idolatry, if we want to be people who are self-sacrificial and loving instead of self-indulgent and bitter, then we need to be worshippers of God. We need to ask God to continually fill us with his spirit because it's only through him that we will live holy lives. And as God fills us with his spirit, there is a natural overflow of worship and praise to God, which is in contrast to the kind of speaking that happens at the start, isn't it, of this section. The Christian who is filled with the spirit won't, won't, won't be able to do anything but encourage and, uh, his fellow Christian and praise God with his mouth. The spirit-filled Christian who's worshipping the Lord ultimately, I think, will be filled with joy. That's what I think Paul's driving at here when he says, make music from your heart. He's, he's not interested in the quality of the music we make, but the, the content of our heart as we make it. Wise people are joy-filled people who overflow with thankfulness to God as they worship him and then encourage one another as they gather together to continue on living faithful lives to him in a world set on idolatry and immorality. 
So, it's been a lot. It's a big chapter. I could have said a lot more. But let me finish with this. Paul's encouragement here for us today is that we be spirit-filled, love-soaked, joyful shiners of Jesus' light in our world, that we reject and rebuke our brothers and sisters who are neither joyful nor full of love, and that we encourage each other to flee idolatry and to worship the true God as his spirit pours itself out in our hearts through faith in him. Let's pray that we're a community that is known for our love and our worship of God. And let's ask his spirit to fill us that we may overflow with goodness and thankfulness for what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.